Thank you. Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio today is rural affairs and islands. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press their request to speak button or indicate so in the chat function by entering the letter R during the relevant question. And in order to get in as many members as possible, I would appreciate succinct questions and answers to match. Question number one, Elena Whitton. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has carried out on the impact on farmers in Scotland of the UK Government's energy price cap. Uh, first of all, I want to say that, of course, we welcome any intervention that can help in this crisis, but the UK Government's energy bill relief scheme uh, is too little too late. I'm aware from my ongoing engagement with farmers that they are facing a range of increasing costs, whether that's animal feed, fertiliser, as well as fuel, and indeed the general increase in costs facing businesses right across the board are all having an impact. And this scheme, I know, comes too late for many agriculture businesses who are already struggling to pay bills. And the scheme is also only in place for six months. I've written to the new Secretary of State at DEFRA to request a meeting and will continue continue to press the UK Government to do more to ease the pressures that are currently being faced by farmers and the wider food supply chain. Elena Whitton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. NFUS Scotland um, are working with their members to gauge how the energy price cap will benefit hard-pressed food and farming businesses. And I understand farmers who were paying under 20 pence per kilowatt hour are now quoted 83 pence per kilowatt hour, which is a 315 per cent increase. Scotland farmers are cru crucial to ensuring that we have access to nutritious food, and local farmers have told me how they are being hammered in terms of rising production costs. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the UK Government needs to go further than the six-month cap and provide more financial certainty and stability to our farmers, or food security will continue to be undermined and the prices on the shop shelves will continue to climb? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, absolutely, I do agree with that. And as I said in my initial response, I've written to the new Secretary of State at DEFRA, Renil Jayawardena, requesting a meeting uh, to really highlight my concerns about food security. And I'll also continue to press the UK Government to do more to ease the pressures that we know are being faced by farmers and the wider food supply chain. We are also seeking that clarity from the UK Government uh, about what plans for protections such as the Energy Bill Relief Scheme after the 31st of March 2023 will look like to ensure that businesses have that certainty and security that they need to operate with confidence. And from the work that we did with the Food Security and Supply Task Force, there were recommendations within that too that only the UK Government can act on and deliver. And of course, we'll continue to press them for action and indeed a response to the task force asks. Question number two, Natalie Don, who is joining us remotely. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the proposals for the rural visa pilot. Minister Neil Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, the Scottish Government's rural visa pilot proposal gained cross-party support across the Scottish Parliament. The proposal has been issued to the UK Government, and we await their response. We call on the UK Government to accept the recommendation for, uh, of their own Migration Advisory Committee to deliver a migration uh, pilot for rural areas. The proposal endorsed by this pilot, uh, Parliament was co-developed by Scottish Government, local authorities, rural employers, academic experts and partners. And our ask of the UK Government is clear. Work with the Scottish Government, local authorities and employers to establish migration pilots to meet the needs of Scotland's rural and island communities. Natalie Don. Thank the Minister for that answer. In August, the NFU estimated that over £60 million worth of food had been wasted due to workforce shortages. Farmers are doubly feeling the effects of Tory policy by not having the workforce available to help them. And now they, like most of the country, are suffering from inflationary pressures exacerbated by Brexit, while the to with the which the Tories forced on Scotland. So does the Minister share my view that unless the UK Government considers Scotland to be beneath their contempt, the very least they can do is urgently agree to proposals for a rural visa pilot? Minister. Yes, I do, and I, I thank Natalie Dawn uh, for that question. It, it is notable uh, that both the Chief Executive and President of NFU Scotland have publicly called for the Rural Visa Pilot proposal to be implemented. Scott Walker stated that it must be delivered, and I quote, in tandem with UK Government expanding the number of seasonal worker visas and a review of the shortage occupation list. At the moment, the Conservatives are the only party in this Parliament yet to support the proposal. Um, 
with Donald Cameron asking for more time to consider it in detail. I know that he's looking to, uh, he and his colleagues will be looking to engage with that constructively, and I hope that they can do so, that, so that Parliament can be speaking with one voice on this, which is such a critical issue facing our rural and island communities. Question number three, James Dornan, who is joining us online. To ask the Scottish Government what its latest engagement has been with the UK Government on the impact of Brexit on Scotland's food security. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government takes the topic of food security in Scotland very seriously. I, along with my fellow Scottish Ministers, have highlighted our concerns repeatedly to the UK Government about the effects of its bad Brexit deal. I wrote on the 26th of August to the UK Government to highlight the cumulative impact on the food and drink sector of labour and skill shortages and rising costs, and have yet to receive a response to that. The Scottish Government will continue to use all devolved powers available to support the sector. However, more needs to be done by the UK Government now to protect our food and drink businesses. James Dornan. Uh, thank you, for the Cabinet Secretary, very much for that answer. And I agree that the UK Government should be doing more and doing it as soon as possible. A recent letter from the Green Alliance to Kemi Badenoch noted that the recent lifting of tariffs and quotas without an equivalence on animal welfare or environmental standards for Australian producers means that UK farmers will now compete with imported food produced to standards that would be illegal in the UK. Does the Minister share my view that Brexit continues to be a monstrous betrayal of farmers, growers, food producers and the, section, the sector in general for which the Tories should be beyond ashamed? Cabinet Secretary. I don't think there's any doubt that food and drink businesses and the sector in Scotland uh, have borne the brunt of the hard Brexit that's been pursued by the UK government. And we've seen the UK government sign up to trade deals with Australia and New Zealand that will be damaging to Scotland's farmers and crofters. And that's even shown by the UK government's own economic modelling. And we also have worse deals with these countries than what the EU has managed to negotiate with them. And I think it's really important to, to highlight an example of that. So, while the UK government agreed to allow unlimited quantities of beef tariff-free into the UK for 15 years, the EU New Zealand FTA will maintain quotas permanently and apply a 7.5% tariff. And in addition to that, the quotas that New Zealand has secured in its FTA with the UK are also much higher than those in its agreement with the EU. And in the first year of the free trade agreement, the UK will allow 12,000 tonnes of New Zealand beef into the UK, while the EU will allow only 3,333 tonnes, and that's for the entire EU 27. So I really look forward to a time when the Scottish Government can work with the EU and work with others to develop and deliver a trade policy that works in the economic yeah. and the other interests of people in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary, Rachel Hamilton. It's no surprise that on Wednesday, the 2nd of November, from Shetland to Stranra and from Kirkwall to Kelso, and here at Holyrood, farmers and crofters will send a message to the Scottish Government that farmers need clarity from this SNP Government and food production needs farmers. This is not a celebration, as your civil servant described at the Rain Committee this morning. Cabinet Secretary, it's taken six years for the SNP to launch a consultation on agricultural policy, and now farmers are being asked to discuss these massive issues with an information vacuum. Despite numerous requests, your department has failed to give clarity on how new powers created by the proposed agricultural bill will put food production at the heart of delivering the expectations that this government expects. The rally is in four weeks, Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Conservatives will be there supporting farmers and crofters. Will the Cabinet Secretary be there to apologise for her lack of clarity? And will she commit to fully addressing farmers' concerns? Cabinet Secretary. One thing I won't be apologising for is continuing to support food production in this country, unlike other parts of the yeah. UK. That was, that was one of the central pillars of our vision for agriculture, which we published earlier this year, where we committed, we committed within that to supporting food production while looking to, of course, tackle the climate and the nature uh, emergencies. That's the, the three key pillars of our support going forward. That's also why we committed to maintaining direct payments, recognising the importance of food production, which is, of course, important now more than ever, given the increasing food security risks that we face. Yeah. Question number four, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address the issue of absenteeism in Crofton. Cabinet Secretary. 
In 2022 to 23, the Crofton Commission received an increase in budget, enabling it to expand its residency and land use team to increase its work in addressing absenteeism and to bring Crofts back into productive use. Through the Crofton Commission's development officers, work is underway implementing actions contained in the Scottish Government's National Development Plan for crofting, including bringing more crofts back into active use. And as crofting landlords, Scottish ministers are considering what action can be taken on their crofting estates to increase active use, occupancy of crofts and look at opportunities for new entrants. Alistair Allen. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and uh, realise uh, uh, that the Cabinet Secretary is aware of the importance of crofting to the Highlands and Islands. Um, crofts falling into disuse as a result of absenteeism uh, represent a barrier to young people acquiring a tendency uh, to make use of the land and thereby remain in their community. Uh, so can she say any more about how the Government's legislative ambitions will create more active crofts and ensure that those who wish to productively use a croft can get access to land? Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for that question and I think I would also just want to use this opportunity to reaffirm uh, our commitment to modernising crofting law as we would set out in our programme for government uh, this year. Now, the crofting bill group was reinstated in May this year to consider crofting legislation and that included the provisions pertaining to the enforcement of duties of crofters and owner-occupier crofts and that includes a residency duty and a duty to cultivate the croft or to put the croft to another purposeful use. Now, a number of meetings have already taken place uh, between between June and September this year with further meetings scheduled and I really look forward to the further development of that work so that we can really try and tackle some of the important issues that the member has raised. Question number five, Willie Coffey. The Scottish Government, what discussions the Rural Affairs Secretary has had with the Public Health Minister regarding how it will ensure the safety and quality of food sold in Scotland in the event that the UK Government proceeds with its retained EU law revocation and reform bill? Proposals. Cabinet Secretary. This is an area that causes us uh, significant concern. Now, Scottish ministers are advised on food safety and standards matters by Food Standards Scotland, and the Minister for Public Health and myself meet with uh, the FSS CEO regularly on a range of issues. And this bill will, of course, feature in the ongoing discussions that we have with FSS. Now, the Scottish Government consider this bill to be reckless, and I cannot emphasise enough the impact that this bill will have on the areas the member has mentioned, as well as more broadly across my own portfolio, as well as others. Now, independently of Scottish Government, FSS considers that the bill will undermine our ability to ensure the safety and quality of food sold in Scotland, because unless existing legal protections set out in retained EU law are preserved, they will be removed from the statute book by the end of 2023. The sheer volume of food and feed legislation is significant. The timescales proposed by the UK Government are ridiculous, and the current protections for consumers are put at risk by this bill. And this goes much further than food safety because the bill also dismantles our environmental and biosecurity protections as well as so many other areas of devolved competence and we'll be doing everything within the powers available to us to prevent the progress of this bill in its current form. Willie Coffey. <coughs> Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that detailed answer. As she is well aware, uh, Food Standards Scotland has already warned about the risk to consumers here and this UK bill will result in the removal of consumer protections relating to food which have applied in Scotland under our protection in this Parliament for years. Does she agree with me that this is another example of the UK Government interfering with and grabbing the powers of this Parliament? And what can the Scottish Government do to prevent a race to the bottom in quality food standards and to uphold the high safety and quality that we have enjoyed for many years in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. This bill, uh, as I've already outlined, does carry an unacceptably high risk that vital law uh, um, simply drops off the UK statute book towards the end of next year. And my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Constitution, External Affairs and Islands, Angus Robertson, is pressing the UK Government to reconsider the bill and its implications for the devolved governments. Because unless it's changed and unless current standards remain on the statute book, Scotland's reputation for high quality food and drink is very much at risk. And I also think it's worth bearing in mind that some of the comments which really highlight the significance of what this bill will mean from food standards 
Standards Scotland themselves, where they have advised that major risks and impacts to Scottish consumers in relation to food safety and standards uh, will exist if the bill is progressed in its current form, adding that even if high legal standards continue to apply in Scotland, the Internal Market Act means that there would be no way of stopping goods from elsewhere in the UK being sold in Scotland produced under lower legal standards. A supplementary for the castle. Uh, this SNP Green government has already shackled Scotland's farmers to EU law with an example of gene editing, and it's not interested in building a farm policy aligned to Scotland's need. Yeah. The UK government offered to extend powers in the UK Agriculture Act to help devolved administrations create their own farming support system, and while Wales and Northern Ireland accepted this offer, the SNP government declined. NFU President Martin Kennedy says he remains frustrated that despite several requests from NFU Scotland and other stakeholders, they have yet to receive clarity on the new agriculture bill. Cabinet Secretary, when will you start prioritising farmers ahead of constitutional grievance? Cabinet Secretary. I, I think that's a, just a complete uh, nonsensical comment from the, the member, which I would just completely disagree with. Of course, we are putting our farmers and crofters at the forefront yeah. of our policy. That is why we are co-developing it with them, to ensure that we have a policy that works. Yeah. Question number six, Carol Mochan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to support the rural economy in areas impacted by long-term population decline. Minister Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. We're investing £8.3 million this year to deliver the National Islands Plan and developing an Addressing Depopulation Action Plan to provide the policy framework to support population retention across rural communities. We're also investing £11.6 million through our Rural Community Led Fund, developing a remote rural and islands housing action plan and investing in digital infrastructure despite responsibility for broadband being reserved to the UK Government. Additionally, Parliament has recently endorsed a bespoke rural visa pilot scheme. The employer-based migration proposal has been developed with representatives from employers across islands and rural communities. Karen uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Can the Minister confirm um, that the £5 million for the abandoned islands bond is still ring-fenced fun ring for tackling depopulation? Top population and if, uh, advise if plans for utilising that resource will be set out in future financial plans. Minister. Uh, I thank Carol Mocking for that question. Obviously, we're working with our island communities to develop proposals around ensuring that we can address depopulation, uh, and all financial issues at the moment are going through the lens of the emergency budget review, details of which will be published as soon as possible. Supplementary, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. <clears throat> Depopulation is often a multifaceted problem which requires a range of levers to address. Many of these, such as matters pertaining to immigration, are reserved. The Scottish Government has clearly set out a case charting a different course to the UK immigration policies, which, quite frankly, don't take into account Scotland's unique circumstances and are therefore harmful to our communities. Can I ask what the Cabinet Secretary thinks the basis is for opposition of the UK government to initiatives which are essential to Scotland's well-being through supporting economic growth and the delivery of public services, as well as enhancing and sustaining our communities. Minister. A lack of understanding of Scotland's rural needs. Uh, depopulation is a complex issue and therefore there are no simple solutions as such. It's essential that we work with regional, local and uh, community partners to develop a sustainable approach to enhancing and sustaining our communities. We're proud in Scotland to have legislation such as the Islands Act, which ensures we take into account the unique nature of communities and develop solutions in a collaborative manner. Without such a close working relationship, I struggle to see how the UK Government uh, can understand the needs of our communities and confess to knowing them what is best for them. Question number seven, Liam McCarthy. Ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to improve the resilience of island communities. Cabinet Secretary. By considering population levels, promoting sustainable island economies, supporting <laughs> well-being, health and focusing on reducing fuel poverty, the National Islands Plan is critical to improving outcomes for island communities and ultimately that resilience. To ensure that we respond in real time to any issues as they arise, I frequently engage with my colleagues across all portfolios to ensure that reporting on island resilience matters is timely and effective, and that provides me with the assurance I need on concurrent risk and allows us to explore any potential mitigations. And my islands officials also correspond with island communities to provide that on-the-ground information regarding any major issues. Liam MacArthur. 
Thank you, and can I um, welcome the work that is uh, ongoing? Having thankfully uh, abandoned the ill-conceived and overly simplistic proposal for island bonds, it appears ministers now intend spending the money, £300,000 this year, on practical policy tests to inform a future action plan. This is unlikely to have them dancing in the aisles. Uh, it will also do nothing to improve transport links, broadband provision or the availability of affordable housing. So, will the Cabinet Secretary agree to ditch the tests and focus these limited resources on, for example, expanding inter Isles air services in Orkney or providing additional support to students wishing to come to our islands to study and who in the past have often then stayed to build lives and build careers? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, I would just want to respond to the member by saying that the detail of any proposals are still to come forward, so I don't think it's necessarily right to encourage me to ditch something before seeing that detail. But as well as the fact that what we were proposing to bring forward is actually based on the feedback heard by island communities through the extensive consultation that we undertook. So I would encourage the member, and I'm more than happy to discuss it further with him in terms of what those projects might look like. But any work we take forward is based on the needs of our island communities. But I would also want to draw attention to the fact that help and, uh, for our island communities doesn't just come from the rural affairs and islands portfolio alone. When you look at our housing programme, the transport programme and all the funding that's being channelled through that, there are a number of interventions that are currently underway and that are currently planned too, which will help with that overall resilience. Supplementary, Jenny Minton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Island and rural communities are amongst the most vibrant, but the cost of living crisis could pose a threat to many of them. It's been reported that households in Argyll and Butte will need to earn more than £72,000 a year to avoid fuel poverty this winter. The key levers to address this crisis rest with the UK Government. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that the best way to ensure the resilience of island and rural communities is for them to be rid of the chaos of Westminster and the callous politics of the Tories? Yeah. 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 Cabinet Secretary. Um, I would agree with the points that the member has made on both counts there, because I think we've seen time and time again how decisions made in reserved areas simply don't take into account the unique circumstances of rural and island communities and the very specific circumstances that they can face. And I think just one example of that, we discussed a bit of this when I appeared in front of the Rain Committee this morning, but when we look at the Shared Prosperity Fund, it's just one example of many. So where the Highlands and Islands were recognised as one of the highest priority areas earmarked for European structural funds. It's the opposite when we consider the UK government's levelling up agenda. Now, £183 million a year is required to replace EU funding, which equates to £549 million over the shared prosperity fund period of three years. However, instead of receiving that £549 million, Scotland will receive just £212 million, and that's over the whole three-year period. And that equates to a 60% reduction in funding in real terms. And it's because of this lack of regard by the Tories that the Scottish Government continue to press them yeah. to take that further action to support our households through this cost-of-living crisis. Question number eight, Jamie Green. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its responses to the emergency stakeholder meeting on September the 12th regarding its proposed new agriculture bill. Cabinet Secretary. Our public consultation on delivering our vision for Scottish agriculture proposals for a new agriculture bill is open until the 21st of November this year. It will inform the next steps in our commitment to co-design via the Agriculture Reform Implementation Oversight Board and I would encourage everyone to engage in that consultation to ensure that their views are captured. It is important for stakeholders, for government and wider society to come together and discuss these issues and work towards shared outcomes as part of the Scottish Government's co-development approach. And I, I trust that this new industry group will feed back to enable that discussion uh, with, with the stakeholders representing the wider rural economy in the ARD stakeholder group. Jamie Green. Uh, I think co-design only refers to the relationship between the government and the minority party that's propping it up because senior NFUS figures describe the agriculture bill as reading more like a Green Party manifesto than a true agriculture bill with very little mention of food security and food production, which surely should lie at the heart of any such bill. Relationships between the farming community and the Scottish Government are at an all-time low in the eyes of many in the industry. Given that the SNP Government have had years, years to come up with a plan for the future of Scottish farming, why does the Cabinet Secretary think that so many farmers are so vocally disappointed and angry about the government's proposals for their future. Cabinet Secretary. 
I don't know if the member has actually been through the detail of the, the consultation that we brought forward, but it sets out the future framework that we're looking to establish and uh, looks at the enabling powers that we'll need as part of any future legislation, where we do discuss the importance and highlight the importance of our food production and food security. And like I say, that's an area that we specifically identified and highlighted within our vision for agriculture, which we are intent on delivering. A brief supplementary, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will know that even when that agricultural bill is passed as a framework bill, it won't provide the detail that, that farmers are looking for on future agricultural support. So does she accept the need to see that detail even before the bill is, is finally passed to allow them to, to plan the future of their business? Cabinet Secretary. I absolutely do accept that and will be working towards delivering that as, and uh, more information on that will become available in due course. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions on rural affairs and islands. We will now move to portfolio questions on health and social care. And I will allow a very short pause whilst members move quickly to change their positions on the front bench. Thank you. So I would advise uh, members indeed that the next portfolio of questions is health and social care. I remind members that questions three and four are grouped together and that I'll take any supplementaries on these questions once they are both answered. If a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button during the relevant question or indicate so in the chat function by entering the letter R. And again, I would press for succinct questions and answers to match in order to get in as many members as possible. Question number one, Maggie Chapman. Starting officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its advice is for patients who move from one regional NHS board to another while on a waiting list for essential surgery. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yusuf. Patients who move to another health board area will join the waiting list of the receiving health board. Uh, while waiting times do vary across health boards and specialities, uh, I would not expect this to have a negative impact on the length of time a person should expect to wait. Clinicians in the new, new board may wish to reassess the patient to ensure it's safe to go ahead with their procedure, especially where there's been no prior assessment or there's been some time that has elapsed since an assessment was carried out. Again, I would not expect this to be done routinely without good clinical reasons. Uh, patients with an urgent clinical need, of course, uh, will always be prioritised. And in all cases, I expect health boards to make every effort to ensure equity of care, that any disruption uh, to the patient's journey are minimised. Maggie Chapman. I thank for that answer, a constituent of mine was, who was first referred in October 2019 has been waiting all the whilst in pain for surgery since March 2020. They recently had to move, fortunately still within the North East region, but they have had to transfer from NHS Grampian to NHS Tayside. To get onto the Tayside waiting list, they have to undergo a fresh assessment. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how patients can ensure they do not have to redo assessments at a cost of time, energy and resources to both themselves and the NHS in order to get onto their new health board's waiting list? And what guidance can we give to patients who might be willing and able to travel to another health board which has available capacity so as to expedite their surgery or other treatment? Cabinet Secretary. I can thank Maggie uh, Chapman for her question and can I say that my thoughts are with her constituent and what is a, a very difficult uh, time for her constituent. Um, th there shouldn't be any detriments to patients who move to new health board areas. In terms of the assessment being done, obviously I don't know the full detail of Maggie Chapman's uh, constituent's case, but I'm happy to, to, to receive it. But as I said in my original answer, um, those assessments wouldn't be done uh, routinely or, or, or necessarily. There, there may be a good clinical reason. I don't know because I don't know the detail of the case. Uh, but I would expect there to be no uh, undue uh, impact uh, on the time uh, that, that her constituent has to wait uh, for the procedures. I will ask my officials to liaise with both boards uh, in this specific case. In terms of our uh, answer to her, her, her second question, um, there, is, uh, there will be a review undertaken of NHS waiting times guidance. Uh, that working group has been established. And again, I'm happy to keep uh, Maggie Chapman and other members uh, updated. And sorry, on our very final point uh, about uh, if uh, there is uh, the possibility to move to another board uh, for uh, that procedure to take place, that can be a board to board discussion. Uh, and there is, uh, for example, financial help that is available for travel and accommodation in certain cases. Supplementary, Sandish Gohani. 
Thank you. Uh, will the Minister guarantee that any patient who moves from one regional NHS board to another while waiting for any outpatient or inpatient services will have their current length of wait time taken into account when, with their new board scheduled treatment and these patients are not simply moved to the foot of the waiting list? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yeah, that routinely would not happen. They wouldn't, the, the, the clock would not reset back to zero uh, routinely. But what I would expect, uh, as I've said to my answer uh, to Maggie Chapman, uh, that, a, that an assessment may be necessary, particularly if time has elapsed uh, between uh, the original assessment or the last assessment uh, and, and, that particular, uh, and this particular moment. So, uh, no, routinely uh, patients would not have their clock uh, reset uh, to zero. And I would be concerned if that was happening in any health board uh, routinely. Question number two, Jim Fairley. No, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask the Scottish Government what work it is undertaking to ensure that patients have access to care packages to help aid recovery at home as soon as possible after a hospital stay. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that people receive the right care in the right place at the right time, avoiding delays in discharge wherever possible. To support this work in 2022-23, we have issued a range of funded packages, including £124 million to enhance care at home, £200 million to increase the hourly rate of pay to £10.50, £20 million to support interim care arrangements, and £40 million to enhance multidisciplinary teams. We are also investing a further £3.6 million in the development of hospital at home, which can provide acute hospital level care at home, avoiding the need for an acute admission and lengths of stay. This funding is in addition to £4.5 million invested, taking our total investment to over £8 million. Jim Fairley. I would like to thank the Minister for that answer. I have recently written, written to NHS Tay Side, uh, the IJB. Uh, Cabinet Secretary Arms of Yusuf, about a constituent of mine whom I will not name, who has been waiting an excessive long period of time for his wife to be returned home after having a stroke. She has all the equipment in place, but they can't seem to put a care package in place for her. The challenge appears to be centred on staffing capacity, which has clearly been impacted by Brexit. In the face of this, can the Scottish Government set out what action it is taking within its powers to support health boards and IGBs to recruit the staff that they need? Minister. Uh, President Officer, I thank uh, Mr Fairley for raising uh, this distressing case for uh, his constituents. Uh, and I understand that you have written to the Cabinet Secretary and will respond shortly. And I'll certainly ask my officials uh, to investigate the situation as it stands, if you could provide us with more detail. Uh, it is absolutely vital that we continue uh, to make every effort to maximise the capacity of the social care system. In addition to that financial investments that I have outlined of £528 million, and as part of our uh, winter planning preparedness, we have been working with COSLA uh, to develop our joint plan for winter. Um, the Government has a long-standing commitment to the principles of fair work for the social care, as I outlined in my earlier answer, and we are fully committed to improving the experience of the social care workforce, including increasing levels of pay and delivering consistent fair work conditions to staff working with the over 1,200 employers delivering social care in Scotland. Uh, on that basis, we have just extended the staff support fund to ensure that social care staff who are required to isolate if they test positive for COVID receive their full pay over the winter months. Uh, and we will continue to work in partnership uh, with local government, with health and so social care partners, to do all that we can uh, to support them to try and ensure that we recruit and retain staff so that we do not have these situations. Supplementary, Willie Rennie. Um, the case that Jim Fairley has highlighted is replicated across the country. I mean, there's 90 people, as of the 26th of September, there's 90 people in North East Fife who are waiting for a care package, either stuck in hospital or stuck at home. That needs to change. And the trouble is, that what the Minister said, he's been saying for years, ever since Shona Robinson promised she was going to get rid of delayed discharge altogether. So why are the plans that he set out making absolutely no difference? Minister. Sign officer, um, I think that what we are laying out is making a difference, but what Mill uh, Willie Rennie fails to understand is that there has been a huge impact on our health and social care systems because of the pandemic. Uh, and we are still in the midst 
of that pandemic, which some folks forget. We have situations whereby um, there are uh, situations where staff are off ill with COVID and other reasons. Uh, and of course, uh, as Mr. Fairley rightly pointed out, um, our uh, health and social care system has faced a Brexit shock. Uh, with uh, one uh, care organisation that I've spoken to losing 40%, 40% of its staff because of Brexit. We will continue uh, to put in place our winter planning. We will cooperate with local authorities and health and social care partnerships. The Cabinet Secretary and I are in a constant round of discussion uh, with uh, the service providers across the country so that we can help them as best we can. But what we cannot do, unfortunately, is bring back all of those folks that we lost because of the Brexit situation. And supplementary briefly, Paul O'Kane. Uh, new research from YouGov has revealed that only 28 per cent of Scots would consider a career in the care sector, with around 40 per cent citing low pay, stress and a perception that the sector is physically demanding. Most shockingly, nine out of ten care workers described their uh, place of work as understaffed. So I, I heard what the Minister said in terms of the winter announcement yesterday. However, what we had as a headline in social care was a repeat of the £10.50 per, per hour wage, which equates to 48 pence, a derisory pay rise. So when is the government going to get serious, engage with staff and unions on the ground and respond to that call for £15 an hour? Minister. Um, I think that what Mr O'Kane fails to say is that if we were to raise pay to £15 an hour at this moment, that would cost £1.75 billion. £1.75 billion. And Mr O'Kane knows that we are already in a stressed situation when it comes to budgets because of the continued cuts of the Tory government. We will continue to do all that um, we Mr. can uh, Minister, to raise Minister, pay. Minister, Minister, please sit. I do not want all the shouting from sedentary positions. Minister, please resume. Uh, thank you, President Officer. We will continue to raise pay and uh, support uh, our social care staff. We have raised pay twice in a year. We keep this under constant review uh, and will continue to do so. And on his point around about career progression and attracting people to the social care prof profession. That is one of the key planks of our National Care Service proposals, to ensure that we get pay and conditions right, but also uh, to ensure that there are career pathways for folk who enter that profession. That is what young people want to see, and those are the folks that we need to see entering care, uh, because we need to grow our own, thanks to the fact that we have lost so many folk because of the Brexit situation. Um, I would point out to members that we are now 13 minutes into this question time session and I have another uh, uh, six questions to take. So I think everybody can do the maths with that. Question number three, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the target to eliminate two-year waits for outpatient appointments in NHS Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the first of these targets set in July to address the impact of the pandemic on planned care was to eliminate two-year waits for outpatients in most specialities by the end of August. Public Health Scotland data shows by the 31st of August that a majority of specialities had no patients waiting more than two years. In fact, 76% of specialities had fewer than 10 patients waiting more than two years, uh, and 71% of territorial health boards had five patients or fewer waiting more than two years. Boards are, of course, working hard to reduce the number of outpatients waiting over two years as quickly as possible, and I'm grateful to our NHS staff uh, who have helped uh, in this effort. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Back in June, the Health Secretary set a series of targets or long waits for NHS Scotland. He only pledged to eradicate two-year outpatient waits in most specialities rather than altogether. The fact is that we now find more than 2,000 Scots have been languishing on outpatient waiting lists for more than two years. This means that the long outpatient waiting are seriously far from being eliminated, Cabinet Secretary. So does the Cabinet Secretary concede that the original targets have failed and when we can expect to see outpatient two-year waits eliminated for good? Cabinet Secretary. I, I'm not sure how Alexander Stewart can stand there and say, repeat what the target was, 
which was to eradicate two-year outpatient waits in most specialities, agree with me that that has happened in most specialities, and then ask me if the target has failed. Uh, that, to me, doesn't make uh, any sense. And I'm surprised uh, that when these statistics were published that Alexander Stewart, in fact, I don't think any member of the opposition could utter a word, nay, even a syllable of thanks to NHS staff who have worked so hard to help reduce these two-year outpatient waits across the board in the vast majority of health boards. There's two health boards that account for 90% of the two-year outpatient waits, Ayrshire and and Grampian, and I can give an absolute assurance to the member that we are working intensively with both of those health boards uh, to ensure that they get that extra support to help them. But let's not take away from the fact that when these targets were announced, within 60 days we have seen remarkable progress right across health boards and I hope he will join with me in thanking NHS staff for their incredible efforts in this regard. Question number four, Polly McNeill. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what new steps it has taken to tackle NHS waiting lists. Cabinet Secretary. I will not repeat uh, what I said in the last answer, but we are working uh, also quite intensively with the Centre for Sustainable Delivery, uh, which will be known to, to, to Pauline uh, McNeill. Uh, they are working with boards to accelerate the implementation of high impact changes, uh, including uh, active clinical referral treatment and patient initiated uh, review. Uh, these improvement programmes will support delivery of the targets that I have just mentioned and provide sustainable solutions for the future. We are also working with CFSD and boards to embed regional and national working to ensure that long-waiting patients can access treatment more quickly, even if that means that they have to travel uh, in order to do so. Polly McNeill. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I did want to follow up on asking him about internal waiting times. For example, an oncologist raised concern with my office last week, that's in Greater Glasgow, about cancer-related scans, which should normally be returned within one week, now taking up to eight weeks. Uh, clearly, if oncologists are waiting for the results of important scans, it will have a knock-on effect for patients in what is a priority area of treatment. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary assure me that he is aware of this, or he is acting on it, uh, and what assurances can he give oncologists in the City of Glasgow, or Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, that worried patient scans will be returned in a much reduced time scale? Cabinet Secretary. It is an issue uh, we are aware of. Uh, I think I have spoken before in this chamber about some of the challenges we are having around the medical oncologist workforce. She is right uh, to, 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 to raise that. Uh, what I would say uh, to uh, Polly McNeill is I am happy to give her more detail off table about some of the actions that we are taking specifically with Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, in relation to diagnostics, cancer diagnostics of course, uh, but some of those other key diagnostics which again we have invested particularly in those areas where we know uh, diagnostics and diagnosis can take uh, much longer than any of us would want to. So for example uh, some of the actions that we are taking in relation to endoscopy uh, and urology uh, and I will give uh, more detail uh, to uh, Polly McNeill uh, and of course equally if she has a specific constituency case that she is concerned about uh, we would be happy to follow that up with the appropriate board. Supplementary Evelyn Tweed. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the latest statistics which show an increase in the number of patients being seen within target times. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm what work is ongoing to ensure that upward trajectory continues? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we know we're going into a really challenging period. In fact, we're in a very challenging period, but the winter months will present significant uh, challenge uh, on top of what we're currently facing. So our, uh, uh, the working that we're doing with boards is to try to ensure that as much and as far as possible, we can protect some of that uh, capacity for elective care. Because we know that elective care has taken a real hit because of the pandemic over the course of the last two and a half years. So we're maximising theatre productivity. Uh, and as I say, we're looking to see how we can ring fits that capacity. Uh, and, and, and the, the Centre for Sustainable Delivery uh, is moving forward with its uh, uh, National Elective Coordination Unit, which will help to make sure that we are making the best use uh, of theatre capacity uh, across boards uh, where possible. We're also, of course, funding uh, uh, boards to the tune of around about £8 million in the course of this winter uh, to help recruit 750 additional nurses midwives and allied health professionals, which I hope will help to boost our workforce over the course of the winter. Question number five, Christine Graham. I thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with NHS Borders. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I last met with NHS Borders on the 22nd of September. We discussed uh, matters of public health concerning uh, the local population. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary's answer. Will the Cabinet Secretary join me in congratulating NHS Borders and all staff 
on the recent announcement that 100% of patients diagnosed with cancer are treated within the Scottish Government's target of 31 days, and that almost 97% of eligible patients given an urgent suspicion of cancer referral have received their first treatment within the Scottish Government's 62-day target. I think that's excellent work on behalf of NHS Borders and the staff. I, I agree wholeheartedly with Christine Graham, and it is right that we, we do um, give congratulations, pay tribute to our NHS staff who have had uh, the most difficult, challenging two and a half years, I think, of their professional careers. So it is right that where we are seeing that progress, uh, that, that we congratulate uh, NHS staff for that. What I would say to Christine Graham is, uh, notwithstanding their excellent progress in borders, uh, I am not satisfied uh, at the levels uh, that we currently have in relation to our 62-day target across the board. Uh, so actually, what a, what, 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 one, one of the areas that I have asked officials to explore closely is for those boards that are doing well, are accelerating, uh, much like NHS borders, can other health boards learn uh, from what borders is doing uh, and hopefully implement that in their boards too. Question number six, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the provision of maternity services. Minister Marie Todd. The Scottish Government continues to improve provision of maternity and neonatal services through implementation of the Best Start, a five-year forward plan for maternity and neonatal care in Scotland. Following a pause due to COVID, COVID we have now received implementation plans from all boards showing an on-track trajectory for completion by the revised end date of 2024 for the majority of the recommendations and for 2026 for continuity of care. Finley Carson. I thank the Minister for response. In a recent letter to the Galloway Community Hospital Action Group, you wrote, and I quote, we expect all boards to provide maternity services that are delivered as close to home as possible. Constituents in my constituency have been waiting four long years with mothers giving birth on the roadside, but still no serious discussion surrounding the return of maternity services in Wigginshire by NHS Dumfries and Galloway. What reassurances can the Minister give expected mothers in this part of my constituency of Galloway and West Dumfries, and I know she is very aware of this, that there is an undeniable need for a midwife-led maternity service at the Galloway Community Hospital in Shinrar to prevent a journey of 150 miles and three-hour round trip? And can you outline what the Government can do as a matter of urgency to reinstate such a service? Minister. So I thank the member for that question. The member is aware that Scottish Government officials and professional leads, including the Chief Midwifery Officer, are in regular contact with the Head of Midwifery at NHS Dumfries and Galloway to discuss these issues and to explore what support we as Government might provide. Uh, the member is also aware that the Dumfries and Galloway Integration Joint Board, uh, which is responsible for the planning and delivery of the mass, vast majority of health and adult social care services within the region, has asked the Health Board to consider options for delivery of maternity services in Galloway and to report to the IJB. And I understand that is to be discussed um, just next week, I think, uh, the 13th of October. Um, and I have asked to be kept informed of progress um, and the outcome of that process. And I am also uh, planning to visit the Galloway um, Community Hospital towards the end of the month, Monday the 31st of October, and I will be meeting with the Galloway Community Hospital Action Group at that time and hope to discuss these issues with them. Question number seven, Joe Fitzpatrick. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address Excuse me, to address the reported prevalence of alcohol-related cancers in Scotland. Minister Marie Todd. The recently published SHAP guidance for health professionals highlighted the risk of developing a range of cancers increases as alcohol consumption increases. And we are working with SHAP to promote this guidance. We are investing £10 million to improve how cancer is treated in Scotland, which includes alcohol-attributed cancers. And we will launch a new 10-year strategy in April, which will take a comprehensive approach to improving patient pathways. We are taking action to reduce alcohol consumption right across the population, including consulting on potential alcohol marketing restrictions this autumn and continuing our evaluation of minimum unit price. Joe Fitzpatrick. I thank the Minister for her answer. One of the, one of the things in the, the SHARP uh, report in terms of the guidance was highlighting that one in four 
um, alcohol attributable deaths in Scotland are due to cancer. And I think it's really important that we do everything we can um, to, to highlight that to, to, the, to the public. The report um, that the Minister mentioned makes a number of recommendations for intervention. I just wonder if there's anything more the, the Minister can say about what the Scottish Government plans to do to make um, health professionals and the public more aware of, of these risks. But I, I want to take the opportunity to, to welcome the, the comments that the Minister made around advertising. Minister. Um, absolutely. The Scottish Government works very closely with Scottish Health Action on Alcohol Problems Chat. And health professionals right across Scotland have been issued with CHAP's guidance highlighting the link between alcohol and cancer. The guidance suggests that professionals can reduce alcohol-related cancer risks by helping patients to reduce their intake. And we're developing a new 10-year cancer strategy to launch in spring 2023, which will take a comprehensive approach to improving patient pathways from prevention and diagnosis right through to treatment and post-treatment care. And this will include alcohol-related cancers. I welcome the members' focus on this issue. As you will all know, as all the members in the chamber will know, directly attributable alcohol deaths rose to 24 a week in Scotland this year, which is an absolute tragedy, but it is simply the tip of the iceberg. It does not include the number of people who are dying from cardiac-related illness and cancer both of which alcohol is a major contributory factor. factor. Question number eight, Mary McNair. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its commitment to universal free prescriptions on the NHS. Minister Marie Todd. Um, absolutely. The Scottish Government have no plans whatsoever for the introduction and reintroduction of prescription charges. We've been absolutely clear that prescription charges are a tax on ill health and that any medication prescribed to a patient to, should be dispensed free of charge, unlike in England, where charges apply and we are seeing patients pay £9.35 per item, not per prescription, but per item. Mary McNair. The Minister agrees with me that the pre free prescriptions are a significant investment in improving health, especially at a time when the prescription charges are costing £9.35 in England during a cost of living crisis. People should not be deterred from assessing, um, accessing the uh, vital treatment and medicines they need. Does the Minister share my astonishment that the leader of the Scottish Labour Party refused to back the suggestion that the abolition of prescription charges should be a Labour Party policy when invited to do so by the First Minister in Parliament last week? Minister. I do absolutely share your astonishment. The prescription charges are, let me be absolutely clear, a tax on ill health and a barrier to better health for many. Charging for prescriptions would mean that many people with chronic conditions or even people receiving treatment for cancer could be liable to pay that enormous charge. Not having to choose between food shopping or vital medicines is a, not a position that you know, having to choose between food shopping and vital medicines is not a position that people in Scotland are faced with, unlike in England, where patients are charged £9.35 an item. We continue to demonstrate our commitment to the provision of free healthcare advice and treatment when needed with the introduction of the NHS Pharmacy First service available at all community pharmacies, a service that's available to everyone who's registered with a GP ordinarily resident in Scotland. And on Labour Party policy, I have to say even the Scottish Conservatives dropped their opposition to free prescriptions in 2017, recognising the popular support for the policy introduced by the SNP administration in 2011. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes the health and social care portfolio questions. There will be a short pause before we move on to the next item of business.